All right, so Psalm 86, and um, before I get into the, the message this morning, let me go ahead and open up in a word of prayer, and then we'll, uh, we'll look at this together. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for the privilege of coming here together, Lord, and to just worship you and to hear from you, Lord. And um, this morning, we pray that you fill this place and fill us, Lord, with the power and the person of your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would speak to us through your word. They would use this time, Lord God, to shape us and to mold us, to help us look more like your son, Jesus. And Lord, as we prayed earlier, whatever we were brought on here with us, Lord, that we would just lay all those things at your feet, Lord, any distractions, any anxieties, any worries, Lord, that we would just give them to you this morning. We love you. We thank you for the privilege of knowing you. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So this morning, uh, we will be in Psalm 86. And uh, the title of the message is The Glory of God um, Through Prayer. The Glory of God Through Prayer. And um, the last time I was up here, we talked about the glory of God through creation and through his word as we went through Psalm um, 19. And um, today, once again, we're going to look at the glory of God uh, through prayer. Here in Psalm 86, a prayer of David. And um, when you read through this, and we're going to read through it in just a minute here, This is just a very beautiful, very emotional psalm that King David presents to us here. And um, many scholars agree that this specific psalm does not point to any specific time in David's life because there are many circumstances or many instances when David was in moments of danger or moments of uh, difficulty. So they can't really pinpoint what time of his life that he's speaking of in this particular um, psalm. But what's interesting about this psalm, as we read through it, we're going to see that David references several other psalms within this psalm. So it's kind of like a compilation of psalms of psalms. And it's, it's very interesting as we read through it here. It's going to be a beautiful thing. And um, what's really cool, what's really beautiful about this is that for almost every statement that David makes within the psalm, he has a reason for those statements. And I love that. And um, as always... God's word has something for us, and I pray and I hope this morning that this will minister to you all as it ministered to me this week as I was preparing um, to teach this. So before we get into the word verse by verse, let me go ahead and read the entire psalm here, and then we'll look at this uh, more closely. So Psalm 86, here David writes, Listen, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Protect my life, for I am faithful. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Be gracious to me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant's life, because I appeal to you, Lord. For you, Lord, are kind and ready to forgive, abounding in faithful love to all who call on you. On, call on you rather, Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cries for mercy. I call on you in the day of my distress, for you will answer me. Verse 8, Lord, there is no one like you among the gods, and there are no works like yours. All the nations you have made will come and bow down before you, Lord, and will honor your name. For you are great and perform wonders. You alone are God. Teach me your way, Lord, and I will live by your truth. Give me an undivided mind to fear your name. I will praise you with all my heart, Lord my God, and will honor your name forever. For your faithful love for me is great, and you rescue my life from the depths of Sheol. God, arrogant people have attacked me. A gang of ruthless men intends to kill me. They do not let you guide them, but you, Lord, are compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant. Save the son of your female servant. Show me a sign of your goodness. My enemies will see and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped and comforted me. Amen. All right, so as we go through this psalm together, What we're going to see in the very first seven verses is we're going to see David's plea, his cry out to the Lord. And um, that'll be our first, uh, the first thing we're going to look at is David's plea. 
And if you look at the very beginning and the very first verse, right, David says, listen, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. So right off the bat, David is asking the Lord to listen to him and to answer him. And the reason why he says here is because he is poor and he is needy, is what the word of God says. And in reading that, by crying out to the Lord from the beginning, um, what David is really showing us here, in my opinion, is that he believes that the Lord is full of love and grace and compassion. And he was well aware of that. So from the beginning, he's already crying out to the Lord in his difficulty, in his time um, of need. And we know through the life of Jesus Christ, the only living example we have of God the Father, when he was living on this earth, he also had great compassion and love towards the poor and towards the needy. And that's exactly what David is asking for here, as he too is poor and he is needy. And in fact, this is something that we've been talking a lot about with the young people in the back as we've been going through the Gospel of Luke. We've been talking about the fact that Jesus, in his earthly ministry, he always met the greatest needs, right? Jesus was always healing the sick. He was feeding the crowds. He was raising people from the dead. Jesus saw the greatest need that was in the room. And um, when you think about that, for example, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 14, and uh, we talked about this recently um, in the youth group, remember there Jesus is having dinner with this prominent Pharisee, and he tells the host, and I'll read this to you here in the Gospel of Luke chapter 14. Um, he says, speaking of Jesus, verse 12, he, Jesus, also said to the one who had invited him, when you give a lunch or a dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors, because they might invite you back and you would be repaid. On the contrary, when you host a banquet, invite those who are poor, maimed, lame, or blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is the one who will eat bread um, in the kingdom of God. So what we see here um, is a reference here um, to, the, um, to the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is mentioned in the Old Testament and is also promised to us, for example, as we read there in the book of Revelation. And, um, but what we can conclude from Jesus, the only living example we have of God the Father, is that Jesus always met the greatest need in the room or wherever he found himself. And that's something that David likely knew um, about the Lord as he was crying out to the Lord. If you look at the second verse, David continues and he says, protect my life for I am faithful. You are my God, save your servant who trusts in you. See, David was desperate for the Lord's help. And if you look a little bit later in the Psalm, if you look at verse 14, this kind of gives us a clue as to what's going on here. And I'll go ahead and read that to you. Verse 14, if I can turn this page. Here we go. So there David writes, he said, God, arrogant people have attacked me. A gang of ruthless men intends to kill me. They do not let you guide them. So once again, David's life was one that was full of danger on many occasions. So this verse isn't specific enough to pinpoint any specific time or situation that David is referring to. However, what we know from verse 2 is that David says that I am faithful. So we know that David was connected to the Lord through his faith. He also says, you are my God. So he was connected to the Lord in his worship and in his honor, his reverence of the Lord. And then notice he also says, he says rather, save your servant who trusts in you. So David was connected to the Lord in his trust and, um, and in his faith. And when you, when you read that, I mean, this is just a, a beautifully thought out prayer, a cry out um, to the Lord from King David. And, you know, David, he was desperate for the Lord. He was crying out to the Lord. And when you think about that in our lives, the, the circumstances, the, the seasons that we go through, where we are completely desperate for the Lord, 
believe it or not, that is the best thing for us. Because in those seasons, it breaks us, it humbles us, it makes us completely dependent on the Lord, which is the safest place to be. Because when you're in God's perfect will, that is the best place to be. And sometimes he has to take us through the dark seasons in our life to get us to that point where we're completely broken, completely desperate for him. And that's all we have is the Lord. And um, I want us all to think about that this morning. Think about that. Times in your life where the Lord has made you completely desperate for him. Maybe you're going through a season right now where you're desperate for the Lord. You're crying out for the Lord. Um, I know in my life there have been many seasons where I have been very desperate for God. And one in particular, it happened about five years ago. And in fact, next week on December 15th, it'll be exactly five years. And um, in that time, I was actually living in Colorado. And uh, my mom had a massive brain hemorrhage that nearly killed her. It was a circumstance that changed her life and it changed my family's life in so many different ways. But God used that to make us desperate for him. It broke us. It brought us to our knees. And, and I remember days, days filled with tears. And for me personally, it made me a weaker man. But at the same time, it made me desperate for God. It helped me grow in my walk and my relationship with the Lord. At that time, I could only cry out to the Lord because like, that's all I had. He was all I had. And it took that circumstance to get me there. And he was all I needed. And up to that point in my life, I had never cried out to the Lord like I did in that season and like I do now. It, it had to take that circumstance to get me there, that season um, in my life. And with my mom's brain hemorrhage and her recovery, um, it, it was so hard because I was, a part of me was mourning the loss of who my mom used to be. And I was learning to love this new person as her brain, you know, it was healing. It was healing from, from the hemorrhage. And, um, you know, suddenly I, I was just her son. And now the Lord was calling me to become a full-time caregiver. That actually lasted for a couple of years. Um, it's like four or five years, actually. Four years, really. Four and a half years that um, I was called to do this, to be a full-time caregiver. And... Um, that is, that is a very difficult thing. You know, I reflect often on that season, and that is probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my life, is to care for another person. It brought a lot of loneliness. It brought a lot of criticism from people. Um, I think the hardest thing for me was trying to make people understand what I was going through. I felt so alone. But in the midst of all of it, the Lord was there with me as I cried out to him. Um, because God's good. He hears our cries. And, and sometimes we think he's not listening to us. And I know at times I wasn't the best son to my mom. There were days where I didn't want to be a caregiver. I just wanted to be her son. But I know God's gracious, and I can only hope and pray that I honored my parents in the way he wanted me to honor them in that season. And, um, but despite all of that, I'm so grateful for the season that the Lord allowed us to go through, that season where he, he just changed everything for us because it made us desperate for him. It made us understand that he was in control. And in the midst of answering prayer, changing us and reminding us of who he is, he was glorified. And that at the end of the day, that's what happens through prayer, is that the Lord is glorified as we cry out to him. And we're going to see this progression as David continues crying out to the Lord. If you look at verses 3 and 4, David continues and he says, Be gracious to me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant's life, because I appeal to you, Lord. So David's dependence on the Lord allowed him to call on the Lord. And notice here that he called on the Lord, it says here, all day long. And he called on to the Lord without ceasing, if you think about it like that. And um, once again, all of us in this room, we've been through those seasons where we're crying out to the Lord all day long, all night long, because that's all we can do. The circumstance has brought us completely to our knees. It's broken us. It's brought us to a place where we know that he is all we have and all we, that we need. And in reading this verse here, this part of um, verse 3, it reminded me of the Apostle Paul there in 2 Corinthians chapter um, 12. If you remember there, he was speaking of these revelations of the Lord. And he says there that in order to keep him humble, the Lord, in the second half of verse 7, 
It says, therefore, so that I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment me, so that I would not exalt myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfect in weakness. And in studying that part of scripture, those particular verses, it's suggested that Paul could have been using a he Hebrew figure of speech. That term there, or that, that phrase there three times, actually means continuously or um, ceaselessly, continuously, without ceasing. And of course, the Word of God tells us through Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 to pray without ceasing. And just like David does here, Philippians 4.6 tells us, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And just like Paul in the process of crying out to the Lord and going through the fire, God always reminds us of his grace and the fact that his grace is sufficient for us. That's all we need is God's grace. And oftentimes we have to be stripped of everything completely to get to that point that moment of weakness to realize um, this truth. It kind of reminded me of this quote I'd once read by Spurgeon. And you know, Spurgeon, he dealt with a lot of depression, if you didn't know that. And here, Spurgeon, in, in this quote, he says, I venture to say that the greatest earthly blessing to God that God can give to any of us is health, with the exception of sickness. Sickness has frequently been of more use to the saints of God than health has. And certainly that's true, right? Um, when we're going through a, a season of bad health, it allows us to, to be completely dependent on the Lord because that's all we can do. Only He can heal us if He desires. He is the great physician, right? We can go to all the doctors in the world, but at the end of the day, if He wants to heal us, He can do it. And I know with my mom, many doctors were telling us that it was impossible, but we know that God always has the last word. He will always have the last word. And he made the impossible possible in my mom's situation. And I know for many of you all as well, you can relate to that. You've had those similar circumstances happen in your life. And the truth is, when we are weak, we are actually strong. And that's, that's really a beautiful thing in Christ Jesus. And then if you look at verse 4, I'll come back over here. I love what he says here. He says, can turn these pages. <laughs> All right. In verse four, he says, bring joy to your servant's life because I appeal to you, um, Lord. And David felt that he could only find joy in his soul as God met his needs. And, you know, even in those seasons where in our minds, we think God is on mute. We think God is not present, like he's absent, like he's not there. In the midst of the chaos and the noise, God's in there. He's in the details. He's making things the way he wants to make them. And often we think we know what's best for us, but at the end of the day, God knows what's better for us. And that's why we have to trust him in those difficult times. And I know that that is easier said than done, because when you're in the moment, you just want to get out of the moment. You don't want to be in the midst of the moment. But God's gracious. He'll give us everything we need to remain faithful to his purpose, because he's good. And of course, when we look into the word of God, we know that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And that's what we rely on. We lean on the Lord for that joy. In verse 5, 6, and 7, he continues and he says, For you, Lord, are kind and ready to forgive, abounding in faithful love to all who call on you. Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cries for mercy. I call on you in the day of my distress, for you will answer me. So if you look there in the fifth verse, which I just read here, you know, David bases his plea on the Lord's kindness, knowing that the Lord was full of mercy. And, you know, the Lord is always ready to forgive, isn't he? God is so good. Unlike the world, who's not always willing to forgive. And that mercy David was expecting as he faithfully called on the name of the Lord. 
And we know from the book of Romans, there in the 10th chapter, the 13th verse, that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Who? All who call upon his name. And we know this to be true in our lives as believers, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, because all of us called upon his name, didn't we? And when we call upon his name and we wholeheartedly declare and put our faith in the fact that Jesus is the son of God, that he died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose from the dead three days later, we recognize we are sinners, we need a savior, there's an element of repentance in our lives, that is what makes us righteous in the sight of God. And even now, as we continue to call on the name of the Lord, he continues to answer our calls and our cries. And then in 6 and 7 here, verse 6 and 7, he says, Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cries for mercy. I call on you in the day of my distress, for you will answer me. David, once again, is asking the Lord to hear him. This is very reminiscent of what he says in verse 1, right? In verse 1, he says, listen, Lord, and answer me. So there he's asking the Lord once again to listen to him, to hear him. And then in verse uh, 7, you know, he says, I call on you in the day of my distress, for you will answer me. And here we see a glimpse of David's faith, um, his confidence in the Lord. And I think that's a beautiful thing when you can come to the Lord in confidence, knowing that he is God, he's in control, and that he can deliver you and lead you in the way that he desires. I think that's like a really beautiful place to be. You can have the peace that you need because our, the Lord, right, is not this fair weather friend that we have. He's always there, even in the midst of the storms. He gives you that peace that surpasses all understanding. And of course, the struggle for us is being in that place where there's peace in the midst of the storm, right? That's the difficulty. But it's doable um, in the Lord is if we allow him to lead us in the power and the person of his Holy Spirit. So in the midst of crying out to the Lord, David is now going to remind us in the next several verses, verses 8 through 13, of God's unchanging character. Okay, so that's the second thing we're going to look at this morning is God's unchanging character. And here we are going to be reminded of who, of who he is, speaking of the Lord. And often we have to be taken to a dark season or a difficult season in our lives for us to remember those things and those blessings um, that the Lord has brought into our lives before. So if you look at verse 8, 9, and 10, um, here we are reminded of the fact that God is like no other. Um, here David writes, Lord, there is no one like you among the gods, and there are no works like yours. All the nations you have made will come and bow down before you, Lord, and will honor your name. For you are great and perform wonders. You alone are God. And this is so beautiful to me as well. You know, David knew that the Lord was different from all those other pagan gods of that time. And when you think about the Lord, you know, we understand him to be an individual who listens, who is holy, who is worthy of our praise, who is merciful, he's good, and he's ready to forgive. And when you think about those pagan gods of that time, um, and even now, like the things that we worship outside of God, right, that people for, that are not in Christ Jesus, worshiping the world, you think of those pagan gods, they're bitter, they're vengeful, they're sexually immoral, they're nothing like God. And David knew that our Lord was different because he wasn't like them. He wasn't like these inanimate objects, like many of these pagan gods that couldn't do anything. Now, David also knew that the works of the Lord were not comparable to anything or anyone else. Nobody could do the things that the Lord has done. And we know this certainly to be true in our own lives, as we've called upon the name of the Lord, how he's come into our lives and changed us and made us look more like his son, Jesus. And those are things that only God is capable of doing. Like we can't change our lives like that. That's through the work of the Holy Spirit as we've allowed him to come into our lives. Everything that he has done in your life and in my life, the things that we thought were impossible, those are the things that only God can do. And I often think of the Apostle Paul. I love his story and the transformation in his life. You think about the Apostle Paul. You look back to the book of Acts there. Um, what happened to him there was only possible through the Lord. You think of the, the, the book of Acts there. Um, then he was Saul of Tarsus. If you remember there, he was making his way to Damascus 
to persecute the early church. He was going to drag Christians from the early church back to Jerusalem in chains to persecute them. He was a terrorist. That's what he was doing. But God changed his life on his way to Damascus. And if you remember there, he was blinded. And after being baptized by Ananias and the power and the person of the Holy Spirit, he finally could see clearly as the Lord had chosen Paul as one of his vessels. And if you remember, eventually he made his way to Damascus. Um, but what's interesting is he got there, not as this terrorist, but he got there as this faithful, humble servant. And what ended up happening is, if you remember, um, he ended up leaving Damascus in a basket through a hole in the city wall because the Jews were plotting to kill him because of this change in his life. And that is just such a beautiful thing that only God can do. Those works are the Lord's works. No one can do that. Only he can. And then notice here in verse 9, it says, All the nations you have made will come and bow down before you, Lord, and will honor your name. So here we're reminded that the Lord is the creator and ruler of all nations. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 7 tells us, Who should not fear you, king of the nations? It is what you deserve. For among all the wise people of the nations and among all their kingdoms, there is none like you. And absolutely, we, we know that to be true. There's none um, like the Lord. And then in Romans 14, 11, As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will give praise to God. And amen to that. It's something we, we can look forward to in Christ Jesus. And then David understood that the Lord was not one among the other gods, small g gods, or even the best among the other gods, but that he alone is God, is what he says here. He alone is God, and there's no one like him. And um, this is actually something we've been talking a lot about um, in the men's study on Wednesday. As we've been going through the book of Genesis, we've been talking about the fact that God, he created the universe. He created everything into existence by just speaking it into existence. And no one can take credit for that. Only he can. And that is just beautiful. It's a glorious thing. And of course, also, when you think about the nations, all these things, everything he's created, only God alone can do that. He is the only one. In verse 11 and in verse 12, he continues and he says, Teach me your way, Lord, and I will live by your truth. Give me an undivided mind to fear your name. I will praise you with all my heart, Lord my God, and will honor your name um, forever. So here in verse 11, it's interesting because there's a little bit of a shift here. Like he's crying out to the Lord, and then now he's asking the Lord, hey, teach me your way, right? And it'll, I will live by your truth. It's almost as if David is reaching this turning point where instead of crying out to the Lord, now he understands that he needs to listen to the Lord. Now he's desiring the Lord to teach him. And many times in our difficult seasons, we're so concerned with being delivered from our difficult circumstance that we forget to be concerned with what God is trying to teach us through that circumstance. Because often the circumstances, the things we want God to change, He's using those things to change us. And it's in those darkest hours that we can have the most intimate experiences with God. Because in those hours, it breaks us, it humbles us, it makes us completely dependent on Him. And when we get to that place, that's when the Lord is able to teach us and to change us. And at that point, He is glorified in the midst of that difficult season. But we have to let that happen. God is always teaching us something, isn't He? always teaching us something. And I know for me, in that season in 2016 with my mom, you know, one of the biggest lessons I learned was who I was in Christ Jesus. You see, when I was called to leave Colorado, come back to El Paso, my hometown, to help with my mom's recovery, I left behind ministry up there. And, um, you know, God took back those ministries because they were never mine. They were his. Those were his ministries. He was just using me to, to serve in those ministries. And what was left behind was just me. It was just me. And I had to be reminded that ministry and nothing else on this earth, those things don't define us. 
Who we are is found in Christ Jesus. That's where our identity is found. I'm always telling the young people this um, when we meet back there. You know, who we are found, our self-worth, all that is found in Christ Jesus. That's all that matters. And I was at a point where I just realized I was just Isaac. I was just the son, a son of the Most High. And I think when he gets us to that point is when he can now teach us the biggest lessons. And I know for me, that was where he needed to have me in order to teach me what he was going to teach me as I went through that season of caregiving with my mom. And big blessings came out of that season, you know, as, as God always uses those circumstances in our life, not only to change us, but to bless us. And um, I saw the wonderful works of the Lord as he healed my mom in many different ways, as he changed my life, as he changed my family's life, as he used that for his glory. And, um, you know, one of the, the bigger blessings was having the opportunity to become a part of the Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel family. It took that circumstance to get me here, but at the end of the day, the Lord desired to use me here, and I'm so grateful for him for that. And it's no coincidence because, you know, I had met Pastor Angel a few months before that event came into my life, and I never thought I would be back here. A ministry that I was praying for even before I came or became a part of this ministry. And God is so gracious. He is so cool because he is so amazing um, because he was working in all those details. He knew what he was going to do with that circumstance. And I'm so grateful for that. Now I see it, right? Not completely, but I see parts of it. And just like David, our heart should say, don't give me my way, but give me your way. Teach me your way. And David wanted to be taught so that he could walk in God's truth is what it says here. And when we start walking in God's truth, that's when our life can truly begin. And then notice that David asks for an undivided mind to fear the Lord. And um, just like David, we know that we can only walk in God's truth if we are united with the Lord. We can't have a divided mind. We can't have a divided heart. Having a divided mind and having a divided heart is a plague in your life. Because you're either for the Lord or you're not for the Lord. And that's something that we have to fight for every single day because when we get up in the morning, we want to be like our old selves and we have to surrender to the Lord. We have to pick up our cross daily and crucify our lives and allow the Lord to lead us and guide us through his Holy Spirit. James 1.8 tells us, to be double-minded makes us unstable in all of our ways. And only God can unite our hearts with him. Only God can do that. This is an effort that takes some part of us, right? We have to be willing to surrender. But at the end of the day, it's the Lord um, who's going to change our hearts. Um, in verse 12, let me. I wish this psalm was on one page. <laughs> all right, here we go. Uh, verse 12, it says, I will praise you with all my heart, Lord, my God, and will honor your name forever. So I love this because what we see here is what David wanted to do with his united heart. He wanted to praise the Lord. He wanted to glorify the Lord, right, through his praises, through his worship. And um, that's beautiful because that is a place that we all want to be, right? Because we were created to worship the Lord. We were created to praise the Lord. And when we have united hearts, that's when we're able to do that. Um, Because God doesn't just want a part of you. He wants all of you. He wants all of us. He's a jealous God. And God is worthy of our praise. And then notice that David calls the Lord, he says, Lord, my God. And if you remember back in the second verse, he refers to the Lord as you are my God. That's what he calls the Lord in the second verse. And um, of course, in verse two, he's calling him that out of desperation. And then here calling him Lord, my God, he's doing that out of praise. So there we see that contrast. You can praise the Lord in any season of your life. And that is so beautiful. Um, Verse 13, he continues and he says, For your faithful love for me is great, and you rescue my life from the depths of Sheol. And um, this, I think, is a wonderful reminder to all of us about the Lord, right? Um, The Lord's mercy, the fact that God has rescued David from many other circumstances, and that he has faith that he's going to continue to deliver him from more and more circumstances, It just shows your faith and the relationship that David has with the Lord. 
And I think about that in my life, and I'm sure you, you all can relate to this, the many, many, many times that the Lord has came to your rescue. And, and it's, it's beautiful because you think about the many, many, many times that he'll still come to your rescue because God is good. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. Um, the term Sheol here, if you look in the, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, uh, they're in the, verse, in the ninth verse, um, that word Sheol refers to the underworld, a place where we are separated from, from the Lord, a place where there's no praise, a place where we are removed from um, the Lord's divine um, presence. Okay, and then lastly, as we go into these last few verses here, um, we are going to be reminded of the fact that the glory of God will prevail, okay? And this is verses 14 um, through 17. And we know that the Lord will always be glorified through our prayers, as he answers our prayers, as he's teaching us through those cries, through those prayers, and also as we remember who he is in the midst of those prayers. All of that brings glory to God. In verse 14, he says, God, arrogant people have attacked me. A gang of ruthless men intends to kill me. They do not let you guide them. Um, so when you think once again about the life of David, there are far too many circumstances where he was in moments of danger, moments of difficulty to pinpoint this specific, specific verse to a specific time in his life. Um, but what we can conclude from verse 14 is that these enemies of David, okay, they were prideful in their violence, in their abilities, and they were likely ignorant of the God of Israel. And David, on the other hand, in comparison to these, to these in individuals, he turned to the Lord, right, who had saved and guided him all his entire life. And if these men were more like the Lord, they too would be full of love and compassion and mercy and long-suffering. And in fact, David describes that in the next verse, speaking of the Lord. He says, But you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth. And um, this is certainly a great contrast between um, the Lord and these individuals that um, were causing some difficulty for King David. And then if you look at verse 16 and 17, it says, Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant. Save the son of your female servant. Show me a sign of your goodness. My enemies will see and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped and comforted me. So here we see a hopeful plea um, for help from the Lord. And, you know, David approaches the Lord. He's asking for mercy and not necessarily for what he thought was best for him or what he thought he deserved, but he's asking for the Lord's mercy. And David asks for the strength of the Lord. And certainly in the Lord, we can find, um, we can find that strength. We can find our strength. And then notice here that David asks the Lord to save him, a son of his female servant. So who's he speaking of here? Well, there he's speaking of, his mom. That's David's mom that he's speaking of there. And if you look back in the first and second book of Samuel, we don't know a lot about David's mom necessarily, but what we can conclude is that David was the youngest of eight brothers. Um, he possibly had at least two sisters. If you look there in First Chronicles 2.16, speaking of Abigail and um, Zariah, I believe that's how you say her name. And we know that David was the son of Jesse, but we're not told a lot about his mom, okay? But him referring to her in this manner as the Lord's female servant, it suggests to us that she was likely a godly woman, a woman who was a servant um, of the Lord. She served the Lord. Okay. And then in verse 17, he says, Show me a sign of your goodness. My enemies will see and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped and um, comforted me. So then notice here that David's asking the Lord to show him a sign of his goodness. And I think sometimes when we go through those difficult seasons, we do that too. We're like, Lord, show me something. Show me that you're, that you're working on this, that you're doing something. And we ask for that sign. And I know in that season with my mom, I asked many, many times. I seeked many, many times um, for that sign that he was working. 
And God is good because he will always show us something, whether it's through his word, whether it's through, it's a, through, a, through a pastor, through a teaching, um, through a brother or a sister in Christ, or just the circumstance in general. The Lord will always show us something as he's working through the situation. It may not necessarily be what we want to hear or see, but at the end of the day, it's the best thing for us because it's coming from the Lord. And then David specifically asking for this sign so that way his enemies would see it and be put to shame. And then notice here, he says in this last part, and I love this, he says, Lord, um, because you, Lord, have helped and, um, and comforted me. So once again, David is reflecting on those past circumstances or those past difficulties in his life when he cried out to the Lord and the Lord delivered him and the Lord used him. And there we see um, him doing the same thing. So his current need, the expectation he was seeking um, would be a result or was coming from those past, um, those past deliverances um, from the Lord. And of course, we know in Christ Jesus that his goodness is a promise to us and it's inexhaustible, right? We can always rely on the Lord's goodness. He will always answer our prayers, even when we don't like how we answered our prayers. That's something that, um, that we have to remember, that the Lord knows what's best for us better than we know if, what is best for ourselves. And because of that, the Lord's glory will prevail because he answers prayer, he changes us, and he makes us different. And God is so good in that sense. So just in closing this morning, a couple of things I want to talk about um, regarding this psalm. You know, we talked about the glory of God um, through prayer in this particular psalm. The fact that God is glorified as he answers prayer, as he teaches us, and as we remember who he is in the midst of all of that. And here specifically in Psalm 86, there were three things that we focused on regarding David's prayer and David's plea. The first thing we looked at is we saw that David was specific about his prayer, right? He was specific what he asked for, and he had a reason for all of those requests that he made. And we know from the Word of God, in James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And certainly prayer is a powerful tool, something we don't utilize enough, I believe, as believers. And we need to come to the Lord um, with those petitions, just as David did here. And also, as he cried out to the Lord, he gave a reason. Um, and the second, the second thing we talked about was, as David cried out to the Lord, he was reminded of God's unchanging character. And, you know, you think about the author of Hebrews. There in Hebrews 13, 8, he tells us, he reminds us of the Lord. He says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's something we can confide in because he will never change. So we can continue to rely on the Lord. We can continue to cry out to the Lord. And, and ask him to help us. And then the last thing we talked about was the fact that the Lord will always be glorified through our prayers as he answers them, as he teaches us, and as he changes us. Psalm 103, 15 tells us, May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice um, in his works. Now, I don't know what everyone in this room is going through right now. Um, what I'm confident in is that all of us are always going through something. And um, it's very important that when we come before the Lord in prayer, that we remember and we understand who he is as we come to him. It's very critical. Um, the Lord is not a God of vengeance. He's not a Lord that doesn't listen. He's not a Lord that doesn't have any mercy. And knowing these things, we can come confidently to the Lord and lay those things at his feet. And we know that he can do some great things for us because he's done them for us in the past. Now, remember that the Lord, he knows your pain. He knows your circumstances. Even when you think that you're going through this all by yourself, he knows exactly what's going through your heart because he's there in your heart. And the beautiful thing is even when we can't put those things into words, the author, Paul, in the book of Romans here, 826, reminds us that the spirit will intercede for us with inexpressible groanings. And the Lord is so good. The things we can't even express to him, he hears them. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us. And when we give it all to the Lord, we remember who he is. We allow him to teach us and to change us. As a result, he then is going to be glorified through our prayers. As we see here in Psalm 86 through um, King David's prayer. 
Because when we're faithless, the Lord will always remain faithful. And just like David, those things that make us desperate for God are the things that are best for us because they're going to bring us to our knees, completely reliant on our boundless Lord. The author of Hebrews there in chapter 4, verse 16 writes, and I'll close with this. He writes, Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Amen. Um, if you're here in person or maybe you're watching via the live stream and maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you want to declare him as your Lord and Savior this morning, um, we do want to give you that opportunity. If um, you could close your eyes, bow your head, if that's you this morning, and, and repeat this prayer after me. Oh, Heavenly Father, um, this morning I want to invite you into my life as my Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you were buried. And I believe that you rose from the dead three days later. I recognize that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Please forgive me of my sins. I invite you into my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and use me um, for your glory. In Jesus' name, I pray these, these things. Amen. Um, if you prayed that this morning, um, we do want to welcome you to the, to the kingdom of God, to the family of Christ, rather. Um, and um, if you want more information on maybe your next steps, maybe how to get connected to a church, anything like that, you can leave a comment there in the comment section. Um, or you can come visit us. We meet every Sunday at 10 a.m. Um, here at the intersection of Hondo Pass and um, Gateway South. And uh, we, we're looking forward uh, to hearing from you. And um, if you're here in person, obviously you can come up after service and uh, we'll pray with you, whatever the needs are. Um, however, you're watching via the live stream. We want to thank you so much for taking your time this morning to come here and to worship the Lord. Uh, we pray that you have a blessed week. Um, we love you and we hope to see you again um, soon.